Chapters Night at Beth Shalom. Tonight we'll be chatting with Anna Porter, author of 10 books, both fiction and nonfiction, one of Canada's most respected publishers for over 30 years, officer of the Order of Canada and recipient of the Order of Ontario. Her latest book, Deceptions, is a savvy art world thriller with a strong independent heroine and is the follow-up to the appraisal finalist for the 2018 Staunch Prize. Richly atmospheric, set in Strasbourg, Budapest, and Paris, this witty, sophisticated novel is a thinking person's thriller, a romp to the last satisfying page. I'd like to ask our viewers who have any questions to please type them into the chat box and I will include as many as I can. I'd like, uh, welcome Anna. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I wish I could be there in person. Yes. Uh, I found Deceptions to be riveting and full of rich detail. I loved art historian Helena Marsh, its heroine, and Attila Fair, former cop and her love interest. The colorful supporting characters, the action and quick pace across European capitals, the vivid descriptions of food and wine, architecture, clothes, and the detailed backstories of the art world, especially of the great painters of the Italian Renaissance that saturate the pages. Story is full of twists and turns, including a very dramatic point where the narrative imitates the art, which I won't reveal here, but I wouldn't want to spoil it for anybody. You were born in Budapest, where much of the story takes place. Did you travel to the other cities for research, or did you rely on the memory of earlier visits when describing the various settings? Um, I traveled to, I, I certainly traveled to Paris. Oh, there's another person's dog barking. I'm <laughs> glad. It's not just mine now. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, uh, I've certainly traveled to Paris a number of times, and uh, and I've been uh, to Strasbourg, and, and uh, in fact, um, um, I was in Strasbourg quite recently when, when we could still travel, and my husband is uh, loves architecture. He spent a lot of time studying the cathedral, which I began to find fairly boring because, you know, one cathedral is pretty much like every other cathedral, but he seems to enjoy that. And, and all the other architectures walking around. So I was on my own and I had a really interesting time imagining things that could happen. And in fact, I took that boat tour that uh, wow. featured in, in the book and, uh, and, I tr and I imagined what would happen if somebody was killed on one of these tour boats. So I was having quite a nice time picturing somebody getting killed on a tour, <laughs> tour boat while my husband was studying <laughs> being, you know, being a serious person. I was having fun. Wow, um, Budapest, great. I've been to Budapest a number of times. Um, but as you mentioned, I was born there, but I've been back. In fact, I was there two years ago for the Hungarian, uh, the launch of the Hungarian uh, version of my book about George Soros. So. Mm. And so I've been back and I, I was there for uh, for Cast and Strain and I was there for Ghosts of Europe. And so I've been there a number of times for book events, but I always find uh, a reason to walk about on my own and and think about the place and, and my sort of deeply contradictory feelings about it, which I think it comes out in this book. Yes, it does. It certainly does. Uh, are all the cafes and restaurants real places or are some of them fictional? No, um, all the cafes and restaurants in, uh, in Budapest are real places. No, I mean in the book. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> the, uh, in the book, in Budapest, they're real. Oh, okay. Oh, um, I see. I see. Sorry. I invented one in, I really wasn't sure whether the, the owner of one of the restaurants would be irritated. Uh, this is in, in Strasbourg uh, because I was, uh, because that restaurant uh, features some, um, 
surveillance uh, equipment. And I thought, hmm, what if they didn't like it and they were, oh. and they could sue. I'm married to a lawyer. Wow, good thinking. So, yeah, so I was worried about that. And uh, and I changed the name, but the location is real. <laughs> and oh. the food and the menu and everything in that restaurant is, in fact, God, I wish I was there. Wow, I know it sounds so great. I really want to go there now. Um, there are multiple languages used by the various characters, English, French, Hungarian, Russian, Polish. Do you speak them all? Uh, not Polish, but I do speak the others. And uh, something horrible happened at the proofreading stage to the French. And I, I, <laughs> and I didn't notice and I didn't look at it, but um, I think it went through a French version of spell check. And you know how spell check sometimes in your, when you're in a hurry and you're typing a message and it changes your words? Yes. Yeah, and then you look at them afterwards and think, oh my God, what did I just? Yeah, well, it happened to some of the French. Oh. So it kind of got really, it got mucked up. But you can still understand what it is. It's just annoying. Oh, it's so it's really, in the book still? It's sadly, yes. I shouldn't oh. have told you this. Now everybody's going to be hunting for the... I, I didn't notice it, but if I do ever go oh, back so and read it again, I'm going to look for it. <laughs> I'm so glad you didn't notice. I hope nobody else does either. I don't think I noticed it, no. Oh, gosh, yes. Well, these things happen. Yes. In, in books, you know, you, you, you think you've done it all and you've read it three times and then suddenly a gremlin... Mm. That's into the pages. Okay. Good to know. You mentioned in the acknowledgments that it was your husband, Julian, who introduced you to the world of art. Can you tell us a little bit about your early encounters with this world? What, uh, what can I tell you? I, I, I fell in love with a guy who um, I thought was uh, you know, a practicing lawyer. He's a, he's a trial lawyer and it's what he has done for, for a living all his life. And in fact, he's still practicing for God's sake. Anyway, um, he, he's, um, he loves art. And uh, the first thing we did when, uh, just before we got married, not to put too fine a point on it, we went to, he took me to Paris. And he, that's when he took me for the first time to some of the galleries and he, he, gave me a guided tour. He said that, you know, the uh, your compulsion when you go to the Louvre, for example, is to look at everything as you go through, you look at, but by the time you've been there for an hour, you, you can't see them anymore because your eyes are kind of shot. So you've got to go with a plan and decide what you want to see and then try and con control yourself <laughs> so you don't stop where you're not supposed to and you don't stop looking at paintings that uh, you would you know you were not supposed to be looking at anyway that's uh, yes he did and he he we still go to galleries and museums uh, when we can travel um, and he's written he's done a couple of art books julian um, it's uh, yeah it's his passion Great. Uh, what motivated you to set your novels in the art world? Well, you know, you live with somebody for a long time and a lot of things rub off. I don't know about you. Are you married? Yes. Yeah. Well, you, you probably know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's a thing, certain things say, and become second nature. And, and for me, you know, I, I did become immersed in the art world and, and I became really interested in everything in, in the strangeness of it. And, and, well, first of all, I became really intrigued by why suddenly at some point, sort of at the turn of the century, um, art became so incredibly expensive and prices have skyrocketed. And, and so I, I became fascinated by why as a piece of art when you, when you look at some of the, some of the art and, and the millions of dollars that those pieces of art command, it's, 
it's it's an extraordinary thing because when the artist painted them, of course, I mean, well, I don't think Van Gogh or Van Hoff, as he used to say his name, ever sold a single painting of his own. Right. And now it's millions and millions of dollars. Right. And one of the museums that's been uh, uh, subjected to criminal activity is in fact the Van Hoff Museum. Hmm. Uh, where so, you know, uh, I think two or three times it's been, uh, it's been the victim of uh, thieves. But you look, look at this, look at, look at the Leonardo, if it is Leonardo, Salvatore Mundi, $450 million. Wow. Like it takes, takes your breath away. So I, I became interested in that whole aspect of the art world. And... Right and fraud, which yes. is a huge business. So, you know, all of that has informed my, uh, yeah. Right. So, added to my enjoyment of the art. <laughs> right. So Bruce brings us to our next subject, uh, art fraud. Lately, I've seen two documentaries about art fraud. The first is Barry Averich's Made You Look, a true story about fake art, which is about the $80 million swindle carried out by Madison Avenue's 165-year-old Nodler Gallery, the largest art fraud in America's history. And I noticed that this gallery is mentioned in your book. Yes. Have you ever visited this gallery? I've, I've, I have actually once, but I, it, I didn't realize. I mean, I, it wasn't, I saw uh, the other uh, Barry Average uh, film as, uh, as well, uh, Made You Look. Did you have you that's seen it. That that's one? that's the one that I was talking oh, yeah. about. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, he's done a couple about oh. art art fraud, and made you look um, is is is. I didn't until I saw the picture of the gallery in his uh, documentary. I didn't realize that I'd been there, but I oh, had. Oh, I see. There. Yes. Yes. Uh, and it is. It's an amazing. It how. Anne Friedman, who, who is supposedly an expert, uh, didn't know or did she know? And, you know, I mean, she made $20 million herself personally and okay. she was accused, but. Yes, interesting uh, story. It's an amazing story. And the guy who did the, the, the paintings, he just skipped. The money, well, he didn't make that much, but he made reasonable, and he went back to China, which yes, is presumably is even now painting, even as yes. we speak. The other film is a Canadian story called There Is No Fake Art about Norvell Morisot, a First Nations artist. It begins with Kevin Hearn of the Bare Naked Ladies, who bought a painting for $20,000 and loaned it to the AGO and, was to and then told it was a fake. A convoluted web of intrigue unfolds, and in the end, the truth is revealed. I also thought that was a fascinating story. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your research process into the lucrative world of fake art? Oh my God! You know, I have read uh, I've read a, a, an enormous amount, um, including several books on fake art, um, and uh, and and I've I have. Um, I've seen a number of uh, documentaries, um, in, including one recently uh, featuring a guy who specializes, well, I think, I think he's just retired, a guy called Robert Whitman. He's the FBI's um, art fraud, art th theft man. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, he, and he tells stories and he's the, he's the guy who, who told the story of, of um, himself pretending uh, to be a buyer for a, for a greedy uh, third party. And he goes and he meets with the people who had stolen all these amazing, you know, Dali and, uh, and, and uh, I can't remember, the Matisse and uh, several other, I think it's six or seven pieces of art. And he he meets and he he pretends to be himself, the bad guy. So and he, and they fall for it. And he's got a bunch of other stories. And, but 
the thing that interested me in part was that art crime is, is a $6 billion business wow. worldwide, annually, annually, $6 billion, of which um, only 25% is theft. And that's what we read about, you know, the Gardner heist. And, uh, right. and most recently, uh, there's one in Spain and there was one in Portugal. And you keep reading these amazing stories about um, theft, but that's only 25%. 75% is fraud. Right. 75% of the $6 billion. So our fraud would include copies as well as forgeries. And can you explain the difference? Well, a, a copy is, uh, is, is, is a copy. It's, uh, it's not, um, it's a forged copy of an original, um, usually a famous original. And if you're familiar um, with ways in which um, you can identify um, when, when a piece of art is not exactly right. Now, forgeries are, are usually, um, copies are usually easier to tell. Right. Um, what, what, what Helena's hired to do in, this, in, in my story is to figure out whether a painting, which is, it's, a, it's painted in the style of a famous artist, but is it really by her or is it, is it a forgery? Uh, I, I think, I think the, the most famous, I mean, somebody that you, you may have heard of, there was a, a Dutch artist called Von Meher and he um, was accused after the war of having sold uh, Rembrandt's and Vermeer's and other famous um, uh, art to Goering who liked to have famous art in his, in his many rooms um, where, he, where he liked to <laughs> enjoy them. Having, having taken them, he believed from people who were probably now dead. Well, Van Meheren was ac accused of having sold him all this art. And he claimed that in fact, all of these were his own personal forgeries. And to prove the point, he painted a couple of them in the courtroom with everybody watching. Wow. And they were terrific forgeries. Now, the ones that he had, uh, he had sold to Goering were all forgeries. Hmm. So interestingly, you know, Van Meher himself became quite famous after the trial. Wow, that's great. Uh, Helena Marsh's methods, for example, a lab analysis of the paints and other clues help solve the mystery of the painting, painting's authenticity. And one very important aspect is provenance. Can you explain to our viewers what provenance is and how it can be manipulated? Provenance is, uh, is the story of a painting from the time that, uh, preferably from the time that it's um, it was it left the artist studio to uh, whenever it is that is that's being uh, examined as as a time it's being sold so perhaps up until today um, and uh, and it it's one of the one of the things that can happen unfortunately is uh, is that a, a a clever forger can get into the, um, into the written history of a painting that might be as, for example, it has been at the National Gallery, the archives of the National Gallery in London have, um, have a lot of uh, the histories of different paintings. And if you can get in there, and if you're a really good forger as this guy was, then you can fake all of that. Now, that's a complicated way to do it, but if your artist is a famous artist, then forging that kind of provenance is very important because millions and millions of dollars are being discussed as, as, as a possible 
Christ. So, you know, the reason why uh, Helena is, um, is so, her work is so valuable is because she can tell you whether something is or is not uh, the real thing. Otherwise, you, all you have is these pieces of paper that show that um, a piece of art had once been in a particular gallery or had been sold by King so-and-so to print so-and-so at whatever time in the distant past. Right. How widespread is, you mentioned uh, for forgeries that are in museums. Uh, how widespread do you think that problem is? Well, it, it's, uh, it is, it is uh, the number is 20%, approximately 20%. Oh, that high. Of the paintings that you see. And I just read a story yesterday. Um, the Mona Lisa was, had been stolen once and restored. And so people wouldn't notice it was missing on this occasion. Um, a copy had been inserted into its frame. And the current, this story that I just read is that another copy, this is after the Mona Lisa was recovered and big celebrations and lots of, you know, wonderful Mona Lisa's back. That is, it happened again and nobody noticed. Really? So wow. this is a current story, whether it's, uh, I, I don't, I mean, you know, it's unfolding. Wow. That's but it is possible. So you do look at pieces of art in a museum and you don't know. Um, Elena's uh, father, who is, uh, who is into art project, that's the way he makes his, his living. Right. And a very good living it is. He, uh, uh, he had taken her when she was young after um, he had revealed that he was indeed her father. He took her to Europe and showed her um, some of the works right. of art that yes. were forgeries. Yes, and you can. It's uh, it's it's said. You know, it, it keeps happening that mm -hmm. you read about um, a museum or an art gallery suddenly announcing that something they've been displaying. So it's their... quite widespread. Yeah. Okay, so we have some photographs that Anna has brought to show us. Uh, we're going to show them and Anna's going to describe what we're seeing. I think this is Strasbourg. In fact, it is Strasbourg. It's, uh, it's, it's um, on the river cruise where the uh, first and rather significant murder takes place. It's taken, this is pictures taken from the boat. And I think there is a picture of a cruise boat somewhere. Randy, can you see it? Oh, this is, there is the cruise boat under the bridge. Oh, yeah. And behind it is, is the uh, cathedral, the famous Strasbourg Cathedral. And the tour boat is just coming towards us. And there's one of the, one of the bridges where, uh, yes, there's another one, another picture. Now, the, the, um, there's a restaurant on the left of this picture. There's a restaurant over there. And that features in the book. Right. There's the tour boat coming to the turnaround point, I think. Uh, and there is, this is the um, Council of Europe uh, building, which again is, uh, plays a big part in, uh, in the book in that uh, some of the uh, Hungarians uh, who are engaged in a variety of shenanigans that uh, I can't tell you about because it would reveal too much. But corruption, I think, is the is is probably the proper word for what they're engaged in. They have jobs at at the Council of Europe. This here is frequently referred to by me in the book as the Gothic Castle. It's in fact the uh, Parliament buildings in Budapest. And, uh, and our heroine, Helena, or Helena, which do you prefer, Andy? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Helena, um, Helena spends a, Helena. quite a bit of time there because she's trying to find out how, who, who had the man 
she had met in Strasbourg, who had him killed. Right. And she, she goes through the, the Gothic castle, the parliament buildings, to find out. And yeah. Hungarians uh, referred, a lot of Hungarians referred to it as a Gothic castle. Right. Although it's not entirely Gothic, but it is mostly Gothic. It's great to see the photo of it after having read the book. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And this is the this is uh, one of the famous bridges uh, in in Budapest, and uh, it features in the book as as a place uh, that uh, Helena runs across, following the bad guy. <laughs> now, would you like me to talk about this one too? Yes. Um, the the painting in question is uh, is or isn't. That's the question to be resolved by the end of the book by a, a woman artist called Artemisia Gentileschi. She, uh, she is, um, I think she was born about 1590. Um, and uh, she became the most famous woman artist in Europe, in Florence is where she, she made her mark. Um, but prior to that, We've got to show another picture uh, so I can talk a little bit about her. So that's the painter. This is herself, self-portrait, Artemisia Gentileschi. Perfect. Uh, this here is a painting that Artemisia did. And as you can see, there she is with her maidservant and she's holding a rather nasty looking saber in her arm, having just lopped off uh -huh. the head of Samson. Oh, so, oh yeah, sad, isn't it? But yeah, <laughs> there it is. So she, as you can see from this, this is a uh, highly representational, it's uh, it's Oreos, it's, uh, it's a fabulous piece of art. She's done a number of them. She did, an, well, everybody did. All the artists of her era painted um, biblical scenes. And if, uh, if they found a buyer, uh, who liked one, he would say, well, you know, could you do another one? So yes, they would. I mean, there'd be slight, there'd be slight differences, but it's the same scene. Um, Artemisia herself is interesting, not only because she was really a famous woman artist at a time when women were not artists right. at all. She was recognized. She was uh, the first woman to have been admitted to the Academia in, in Florence, uh, as an artist, an, an incredibly huge honor. And her beginnings, I don't know, do you want me to talk about that, Randy, or would you rather? Sure, not? yeah, sure, why not? I was gonna ask you, but go ahead. Okay, go ask me then. <laughs> no, no, um, I, I was gonna talk about, you know, the, the strong women in the book. Yes. Yeah. Well, she, she, she was a very, she was a powerful lady, uh, a, a really determined, brave woman. When she was a young girl, her father's name was Orazio, and uh, Orazio Gentileschi, and you can see his paintings uh, all, over, all over the world, very famous artist himself. And uh, he, uh, he had given her lessons, and he also engaged a friend of his who was another artist to give her more lessons. Now, this particular artist um, raped her, his name was Tassi, we'll go down in infamy because he did rape her. And in those days, this is, she was uh, 17, I think, uh, 16 or 17. And uh, um, he, she was going to not say anything about it because she knew what the laws of the time were like. So she wasn't going to point the finger but her father felt that his own reputation had been besmirched. So he sued, he sued Tassie. And she ended up as so many women have done to be the one on trial. So they kept examining and cross-examining and humiliating her, including uh, they tortured her by tying um, a rope through her fingers around and around her fingers and tightening it and tightening it until 
it was just agonizing. And this is her fingers and she, she's an artist. So you can imagine the horror of this uh, for her. The uh, interesting, uh, well, I think it's, it's quite painful, but interesting to read. And you can read a translation of the trial. Um, that trial has survived and I read it and it is really painful. So, you know, it seems to me to be fairly obvious that why Artemisia does so many beheadings of guys. She, she really Probably. had some reason to be extremely yeah. angry with Tassie. And after, after, um, after all that, her father married her off to a guy uh, with a big dowry for her because she obviously was damaged goods. And she, her relationship with this artist, uh, he, he too is an artist, a guy. He's, he's not a great artist. I mean, I've never seen a painting of this, <laughs> although apparently there are some, but I've never seen one. Right. He, but she became a very, very famous. She overcame all of this to become one of the great artists of Europe. Right. So there you are, strong women. Helena's a strong, oh, there, there she is again. Yeah. See this? Yeah. So that's, that's her, like she painted her own face on the- Yep, that's- and what, is this, what is this scene depicted here? I, I think it's, I think this looks like, God, can you tell? I, I, I'm having trouble seeing the painting, but it looks like another, uh, it, looks it looks like, like another- Judith, right? Judith? Uh, Judith? Yes, it looks like another Judith, yes. Okay. Yeah, it is. Okay. It is. I'm seeing it now, it's coming through. Yes. I don't know if I, can everybody else see it? I can see it. Okay, good. It's just my computer. Is this the one in the, in the Uffizi gallery? I don't, I think it is, yeah. Okay. There That's are good. two of I'm mention here. that later. Yes. Okay, do we have any more paintings, is that it? I think that's it. That's it. Okay. So Deceptions is full of strong women, as we've just talked about. Helena Marsh is a vibrant, bold, fiercely independent woman who is beautiful, intelligent, athletic, fearless, and dangerous. Almost a superhero like Wonder Woman or a female James Bond. Uh, from where did you draw the inspiration for this character? Is this character modeled after anyone? Well, you know, I, it, it seems a little odd, but I think to some extent it's, it's uh, my daughter, my daughter, Catherine, she is absolutely fearless. She's, uh, she also, she's run marathons. She's very fit. She does yoga. Now, best of my knowledge, she's never, uh, she's, she's never killed anybody. <laughs> but I think, I mean, if, 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 uh, if one of her children was threatened, I think she would and could. Uh, she's, uh, she's the New York Times uh, Bureau Chief uh, for Canada. Wow. Is just back from Haiti where she was covering the, uh, the events uh, after the assassination of, of the president. Wow, excellent. So, okay, yeah. so deception in a way is like a Russian nesting doll. As you peel away the layers, there's yet another strong woman and there's another one which is the subject of the painting itself, Judith. According to Wikipedia, the book of Judith is a deuterocanonical book included in the Septuagint and the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Christian Old Testament of the Bible, but excluded from the Hebrew canon and assigned by Protestants to the Apocrypha. It tells the story of a Jewish widow, Judith, who uses her beauty and charm to destroy an Assyrian general and save Israel from oppression. Though not part of the Hebrew Bible, the story does appear in the Midrash of rabbinic literature, where Judith is portrayed as gorging the enemy on cheese and wine before cutting off his head. Judith and her act of heroism have been depicted in many paintings of masters from Caravaggio to Klimt. Was it this idea of a strong female figure that led you to include Judith in the story alongside Helena and Artemisia? I, I think you're right. <laughs> she, she's uh, she is a um, she is a perfectly 
brave and very, I mean, she would have, in, in addition, I mean, you know, when you read the story, you had a sense she had to be pretty powerful, pretty strong to have been able to do what she did. Right. So, yeah, I was impressed by her. Um, the character Ivan Vazari is a politician and member of the Council of Europe based in Strasbourg. We saw the photo of the beautiful glass building appointed by an authoritarian prime minister with ultra right wing xenophobic views who lavishes favors and EU dollars on the party faithful. He and his chic wife Gisela live in an elegant house in a wealthy part of town. The intricate relationships between the various political figures, criminals, oligarchs, and police officers across multiple countries lends a high level of complexity to the story and keeps us guessing right at the end. Were Ivan and the other politician characters modeled on real people or were they inventions or composites? Or? Um, being very careful of the possibility of being sued for libel, of course they're all inventions. <laughs> um, and uh, as you probably uh, as you probably don't imagine that the uh, kindly uh, person who is in charge of uh, <laughs> the country of Hungary at the moment could yes. possibly be anything in this book. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, but I have I have met him, and uh, yes, what can I say? Okay, enough said. Enough the said. The character Vladimir Azarov, quote, one of the less violent Ukrainian oligarchs Helena has encountered, seems to be interested in Helena as well as the painting. He follows her in a black SUV with a driver, champagne, roses, and offers her various invitations throughout the book. What was the inspiration of this character as well as the other pursuers of the painting? Russian oligarch, Piotr Dezinovich Grigoria and Polish aristocrat, I don't know how to pronounce it, Vaclav? Yes, Vaclav. Lubor Mirsky. Were they uh, also? Um, they, uh, the, the, the Russian, um, I had actually met this, a person who is very much like this person. And I, and he was, um, he was surrounded by, uh, by a lot of um, quite obviously armed uh, bodyguards. Uh, and he was staying at, um, at the Four Seasons Hotel in Budapest. And uh, he, was, uh, he had a, a, an insanely gorgeous uh, uh, wife, probably 40 years his junior. And he was handing out um, uh, large tips and I watched him in action and was fascinated by him. Um, he is, uh, he's a real baddie in, in the book. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, the Ukrainian is less so, he's a little mixed. Um, I met a man very much like him um, in, in Nice. Um, where I, I, I love I, I love Nice. I like to go there. I like to walk along the Promenade des Anglais and, and go into some of the lovely places where you can have a glass of wine and watch people. And, and, and I'm a people watcher. And I watched him for, for a while. I didn't want to watch him too, obviously. And I took, I, I really became interested in who he was. And the, um, this is a, a little a restaurant, a big, not a little restaurant, a big restaurant um, on the water, but it belongs to uh, one of the chic hotels um, on the promenade. And I, and I wanted to find out about him. And I asked, uh, I, I, did, I didn't go to the front desk, wouldn't have told me, but the doorman did. And he told me a little bit about him and I became quite uh, intrigued by, he was an art collector this person whose name is not in real life, Vladimir, but I've met someone like that. Okay. Uh, are there any fiction writers in particular who have inspired you in, in your writing your novels? Oh, 
Well, that's interesting. I I love I love crime fiction, um, and and I read a, a huge number of mysteries. I I love mysteries. So Ruth Randall, I I would say Ruth Randall has you know I read everything of 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 Ruth Randall, everything she's written and and still do. Um, I've read quite a lot. There's, you know, there's an annual conference. It's a convention called Bowser Con. I don't know if you, I mean, if you're not a mystery writer or fan, you would never go there. Um, but you can go there and you can, you can hear um, your favorite uh, mystery writers read. And I, 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 I listened to Kathy Reich's re read there about three years ago, and I, I really was. I, after that, I hadn't read her before. After that, I started reading her and I like her. I, Canadians, you know, I, I, like, uh, I like Bill Deverell and, 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 and he's a, he writes intricate, um, well-paced, really interestingly um, constructed stories. Uh, uh, he, uh, well, also Louise Penny, I surely, you know, if you're a, if you're a mystery, uh, reader as I am, you've got to like Louise Penny. I mean, it's it's she also is she she's a very good writer. Um, the stories are comfortingly predictable. I mean, you know everything's going to come out all right, and I think that's probably why people read mm -hmm. mysteries. But if I was going to suggest a favorite Louise Penny, I jotted down in case you're going to ask me this. I jotted down Bury or Dead. I think that probably is, it's a, it's a, it's a lovely, it's a, it's a great story. Um, I like to read Flynn um, and I recently read Gone Girl, which is very, um, very good. I saw the film. <laughs> yeah, good, good stuff. It's, you know, when you look at the different kinds of mysteries um, and I, again, I never really focused on how many People who are aficionados as at Bajacon, which there must be 500 people there, they know, they know if they like, for example, cozies, like the British, like Agatha Christie is, writes cozies. They're kind of nice, nicely con controlled, everything's in a space, and there's usually a, a, some big country house, and you know, they're, that's a wonderful word, cozies. And then there is the forensics, like Kathy writes. That that's a whole genre all by itself. Isn't that interesting? I don't know. And legal Gresham is legal. Right. Um, domestic Gone Girl is is known as domestic. And if you read Cozies, it doesn't mean that you also like domestic. Isn't that, right. I, mean, I just think it's so interesting. Yes. Look, have you read uh, Shari Lapina at all? Um, I who... I've heard of her. I haven't read it. I don't. Think. No. Good, good, fun writer. Yes. Fun. And, and again, um, you can be a little bit more surprised with some of these other writers than you are with that. With that kind of you really, really know. She, she pulls fast ones, you know, like she refers to some something that should have triggered a memory, but, it, but it, it, it's not there. I love that. I love to watch her manipulate the reader. Oh, I see. Anyway, that's, uh, that's mysteries. Great. Mysteries are wonderful because everything in the end, unless it's there's a, a trend for mysteries where the storyteller uh, can't be trusted, but mostly the storyteller or the character telling the story or the point of view can be trusted and everything will turn out okay. And the bad guys will be punished and the good guys will triumph and everything's going to be fun. It's, it's really comforting during COVID. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to turn to some of your nonfiction books, if that's okay. One of your books that has won multiple prizes, Kastner's Train, is a powerful story about a fascinating and controversial man who bargained with Adolf Eichmann to save the lives of thousands of Jews. Uh, and I have Irving Abella's review. I'm just going to read the, an excerpt. Um, it's this is a remarkable, largely unknown story of a man who probably saved more Jews during the Holocaust than Oscar Schindler, 
an extraordinary Hungarian Jew, Rezo Kastner, gave up everything, including his reputation and ultimately his life, trying to rescue Jews from the blood crazed Nazis and Hungarian fascists. It is a gutsy book, passionately written and brilliantly researched. It's historical knockout, a tour de force. Anna Porter has resurrected Rezo Kastner from the dustbin of history and restored him to the hero that he was. Uh, what motivated you to write this book and how long did it take to write? Oh my God, um, what motivated me? Um, I first, uh, I have, you know, I've always, I've studied the Holocaust. I've read about the Holocaust, uh, particularly Hungary, because, because from when I was a child, it just seemed so extraordinary that these people, the Hungarians, who are fun-loving and they cook, you know, wonderful chicken paprika, and and they're, you know, they're lovely, entertaining, lovely people, lots of music and laughter, and it seemed to me absolutely incomprehensible that they would take part in the mass murder of their fellow Hungarians, the Jews. So from a very early age, I, I was interested in, 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 I wanted to write eventually something about the Holocaust in Hungary, particularly in Hungary, because that's where I was born. And, uh, and then one day, um, I heard the story of Reza Kastner from uh, a Canadian Hungarian or Hungarian Canadian. Was it Peter Mann? Mann? Yeah. And he told me the story because he, he and his wife uh, were moving out of the house uh, that they, they had been living in. They're moving to a new place. And he uh, was going through photographs and he showed me some photographs that reminded him of this story and he told me the, the Kastner story. And it's the first really uh, that I'd heard in the first book, interestingly, I mean, in, in, in the story that the way he told it, Roger Kastner was a hero. And then the next book I read, he was the devil incarnate. Which book was that? Um, oh God. Um, Oh, Second World War writer, American. Um, um, his, oh, he really, that, he, he was, pardon? That fits in with what happened to him in Israel. Well, yes, but he, the, the guy, um, why can't I think of his name? I, I know why I can't think of his name, because I, I, my head is into deceptions, that's why. Yes, yeah, sorry. He wrote, um, <laughs> yeah, he was, he, he reported on the trial. He was an American Jew. He reported on trial. He believed at the time, he believed absolutely. And to the end of his life, he believed that Kastner had really betrayed everybody and that um, he could have done more um, to save people, that he didn't let people know that they should escape. So that he had information that he hadn't revealed. And uh, Oh, okay. why can't I think of his name? I've got ben the book. Hecht. Ben so, Hecht. Ben Hecht, thank you. Who Harvey. Said that? Harvey. Har oh, Harvey. Harvey. Right. Thank you. Ben Hecht is the guy. Yes. That's right. Harvey, thank, thank you. you Harvey. Long, long time no see. <laughs> yeah. How you doing, Harvey? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm good for something still. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Are you were good for that? The brain okay. is still working. The body is yeah. falling apart, but the brain is still operating. Well, I appreciate I, it. This Ben Hack, that's the man. Ben. Yeah, he was a he was a great screenwriter. I think he yep. wrote um, uh, the biblical books, uh, whatever. It is. Biblical book. Okay. Uh, film. Okay. Yeah. He tried Exodus. So what was it? <laughs> Anyhow. Okay. That's... Thank you, Harvey. Thank you. Um, right. And you also wrote a book about your grandfather, Billy, a magazine publisher who had a huge influence on you, called the Storyteller which I will read eventually. Um, and you've written that he hid Jews in his basement during World War II and that he's been honored as a righteous among the nations at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Have you ever been to Israel? Oh, yes. I've been to Israel several times. But first of all, I, I had to go there to, uh, to, be, to research um, Gasna's train. Right. 
and I've and I've been back a number of times. So not to research, just to be there. So right. yeah, I've been there, um, and I've been to Yad Vashem. Um, oddly enough, uh, given how controversial uh, Kastner still is, there now is a, a photograph of, of Kastner and uh, his committee. Oh, his at Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem. So I and has, see that. Has, I'm assuming that the book has been translated into Hebrew. But the book has not been translated into Hebrew. Really? Surprised me all that much. No. Wow. He's very controversial. He's, yeah. uh, he's still, uh, he's Has still, it been well received in Israel in the in English or? Well, yes, I've, but yes and no. Uh, some people um, have uh, have been very complimentary about it, and some people have been the exact opposite. I mean, there was a uh, there's a book um, as recently as I think maybe four or five years ago. That is still the entire book is a condemnation. Of really, him. so right. you know the story continues. It's it's not. It seems to be a story that never dies. And right. I had hoped, you know, when when I wrote the book, I had hoped that indeed, as as uh, Ichiabella says, that his reputation would have been restored. But no, the controversy go goes on. Yes. Uh, back to deceptions. One of my favorite characters in the book is Gustav Attila's Dachshund. Was he <laughs> modeled on any particular Dachshund in your life? Yes. Yes. I inherited a Dachshund called Gustav from my mother when she died. It was my inheritance. And uh, he was uh, very similar in every possible way to Gustav in the book. Very similar. <laughs> Quite a very stubborn. important character in the book. Oh, yeah. Very stubborn. <laughs> okay. Um, tell us a bit about your process for writing fiction. Where do you do your writing? Do you write every day? Do you map everything out? Or do the characters take on a life of their own and lead the narrative? Um, all of the above. <laughs> uh, I write wherever I can. Um, and uh, and sometimes it's difficult to find uh, to find a, a place that's quiet uh, where I can actually focus. So I have learned over the years to write with a lot of noise around me. Um, but not having a day job actually really does reduce the noise. It's uh, I, I I gave up uh, I gave up my my publishing business to write Castle Australia. Right. And, you know, I, I haven't ever been sorry that I gave it up. And how long did it take to write? Kastner Strain or... Kastner Strain. Uh, maybe five years. Wow. But, but part of that time I was still working. Okay. So, you know, it's... Um, and then I just realized that I couldn't. I, I, I couldn't keep working and living in that in that area in that time it's it's not uh, it's, right it's heavy i could write mysteries uh, i and did write three mysteries while i was in publishing in fact it was therapeutic because there are a lot of people in the book business that i wanted to kill off and <laughs> they could actually do it that's you know, good <laughs> I mean, you know you really you did it in the book you know, it's but in a book it's it's therapy Yes. A lot of people, you know, that people pay a lot of money for the kind of therapy that you get from doing somebody in who's done you harm. <laughs> How do you find the pandemic has affected your writing schedule? Is it, was it easier to write or harder to write? And how has the pandemic affected book sales, particularly mysteries and thrillers? Well, to answer the second question first, since that was the last you asked, um, I, I, I talked with there's a there's a guy called Otto Penzler in uh, in New York who uh, runs something called the Mysterious Bookshop and also writes, writes, runs the Mysterious Press. And Otto to told me that his sales had almost doubled during wow. the pandemic. So I I I did a little bit of additional research, and it turns out that everywhere mysteries 
the reading of mysteries has gone up exponentially during. And I, I honestly, when I said earlier that it's really wonderful to have a story that ends happily and mysteries usually do. I think it's, I think maybe that's why, but I don't know. Um, in, in terms of my own writing, I really have found it more difficult rather than easier. Um, I find the pandemic distracting in every possible way. Mm -hmm. The fact that my grandchildren haven't been going to school is a distraction itself, a happy distraction because I like to spend time with them. So I spend a lot of time that's, hanging out with them. That's and, very nice. Uh, I don't know whether you write yourself, but if you- I do, I am working on something. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, I, it's very difficult to write when you're surrounded by kids. Absolutely. That's just a word of advice. <laughs> <laughs> what project are you working on now? Is there another Helena Marsh thriller in the works? Well, um, here's the thing. I, I, have, I have a Helena Marsh uh, thriller that I have been mulling over. And, uh, but, but I've started writing. I, I'm, I'm more than halfway through another book, which is not a Helena Marsh thriller. Oh. So Helena will have to wait a little. She's a very impatient woman. <laughs> invading my time she keeps wanting to be in another story and uh, i had a call uh -huh. today she has from, taken uh, on a life of her own then yes, yes she has she, i had a call today from my agent and he has sold um the option to make uh, a television series oh wow both books the appraisal and and the and deceptions that's television. very exciting news and the uh, he said they have, and I can't tell you who, but a, an actress has been a, a woman, actor has been wow. a woman, and she happens to be an Israeli. Really? <laughs> Isn't that funny? That's unbelievable. It's a straight, anyway, so whether it will happen, you know, the thing with, these, these, these are not chickens you ever count until they're hatched. That's really wonderful. Congratulations. And I have one final question, if we have time. There are two elements of deceptions that, uh, well, the first one is the painting of Judith and Holofernes by Artemisia Dantileschi, which hangs in the Uffizi Gallery, which we saw a photograph of, as well as the city of Strasbourg, feature prominently in the new documentary film Roadrunner about author, chef, and TV personality, Anthony Bourdain. Have you seen the film? And isn't this an interesting coincidence? No, I, I actually, I haven't seen the film, but now that you tell me, I am making a note of going to see the film. I was blown away. I That's said, amazing. things are in the book, in your book. Yeah. It was a yeah. very strange coincidence. <laughs> well, there is going to be a film uh, about Artemisia that's oh. scheduled to come out. Um, I think it's next year. I, I saw the announcement. Wow. So, and I don't know who's making that's it. That's exciting. It is. Yeah. Now that you've introduced that I'll see. us, then we know Pardon? who she is. Pardon? Now I that you've introduced all of us to her, because I didn't know about her until I read your book. So I'm very looking forward to that film. Uh, I think our time is up. I'd like to thank all our viewers for joining us this evening. And a huge thank you to Anna Porter for taking the time to speak with us and answer all our questions. Thank you, everyone. And good night. <laughs>